it's snowing. <laughs> it has been. Still is, I guess. Well, I'm so glad that it's not uh, three degrees or something near akin to that. But so glad to see all of you here this morning. We welcome you. And uh, I might just mention we have, of course, youth convention is going on in central, in central Pennsylvania. And we have, uh, Sherilyn said, I know there's 55 here, and I'm not sure I've counted them. All. So 55 or more of our church family are in Pennsylvania at the youth convention. And God has given them a wonderful time and uh, so very grateful. Uh, so very grateful they're not battling snow like they often are at the convention. But uh, I think somebody said they had 1,400 in attendance on Friday night. So, uh, so quite a crowd for youth convention and God is helping them. Anybody else watch Ellie and her daddy? Oh my, several of you have. If you haven't, you ought to go on and, and watch them. And uh, Brother Miranda is quite a fiery preacher. You get a handkerchief and shh, swing that handkerchief, and Ellie got her handkerchief, she'd swing hers when he swing his. <laughs> and uh, once uh, he was preaching about Jacob and how after he had the conflict or the wrestling with the angel, and the angel touched him and he limped. And he started limping across the con the uh, platform talking about Jacob and right behind him was Ellie limping like she did. <laughs> but God has used them and it's been a wonderful time and so we're very grateful. Yes. Why don't we stand together? Let's welcome the presence of the Lord. And we need his help on this Sunday morning. Lord. What a joy it is to be in your house. Yes, yes. We gather today with such joy in our hearts that you are on the throne and you are here to meet with us, your people. And you promise to be here when we gather in your name. And we do that in your name. And we, we ask for your help. Honor our, our presence and with, uh, with your presence this Sunday morning. And may each of us be keenly aware that God has a distinct plan for this service. Yes as it relates to us. Yes. Have your way and help us. Yes. And we'll give you praise for all that you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Remain standing. Rick's coming to lead us. Now we're working several real hard this morning because of our, our so many of us gone, Byron and Amy. How many did you have in your class this morning? 24. 24. <laughs> <laughs> they moved to the youth class so they could combine classes. And, and uh, Rick taught Sunday school class this morning. And he's leading singing for us. And uh, so let's join and get our songbooks and sing together as we please. All right, if you'd like to reach down and get your hymnals, turn to hymn number 129. I would like to have been able to bring Nellie Edwards here, the one who wrote this song, and say, Sister, what did you really mean by being covered by the blood? Of course, I really, that really struck me this morning because I just got pretty theological in the Sunday school lesson and I was wondering what Nellie thought about being covering our sins. Yes. Now here's the way I would like to interpret it if Nellie was here. I think what she means is the fact that our sins have been atoned for. It doesn't mean that he covers our sin and that the fact that it's by a blanket of the blood and that we can continue living that way. That's not God's plan. And I think we all understand that. But I would like to have asked Nellie if that's what she meant, but I don't think she did. Because you look at the rest of the verses and other words of the song, and we've realized that our sins are blotted out, she says, toward the end of the chorus. So I would tend to think she might be on the Arminian side is the fact that she believed in the fact that yes, Amen. blood covers our sin, but yet it goes further and it blots it out. Hallelujah. Yes. And the fact that we can live holy and blameless before Amen. God. Amen. Thank God. Let's join together on 129.
first time she went to a service and heard a gospel message, she went to the altar and gave her heart to the Lord and followed the Lord from that point on. And I'm very, very grateful for yes, that. Sir. But I'm also, and I never sing, I don't think I ever sing such love without getting to that verse that for a willful outcast such as I. Yes, sir. Yes. Because I'm very grateful that my mother gave her heart to the Lord and raised her family raise her family to serve Jesus. And I don't remember, Tim, I don't remember learning that song. I hope he does. I hope he gets back to a point in his life where he looks back and says, I don't, I don't remember. I remember singing that as a child, but I don't remember learning that. <laughs> and I, that's the way I was. But, it, but on the other hand, I, I had rebelled against God. Mm -hmm. Wanted my own way. And I'm glad there was a mercy 
for a willful outcast such as I am. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and I'm glad it came to the place where the far off country wanderings oh, all yeah. are done. That's yes. it. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. Uh, Anybody else feel like you need to testify this morning? I just kind of felt that testimony on my heart this morning. Yes, Joe. Mary and I had a conversation last night. I was telling her, because um, we were talking about language that was being used today and other things that were being done. And I told her, I was testimony of God's redeeming grace. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Anybody else want to give God praise, Brother Nick? Well, I was a willful outcast. I yes. wasn't raised in the church or a Christian home, but as a, as a Sunday school boy, God dealt with my heart different times. I didn't understand all of it, but I knew what God had touched my heart. I knew that, but I chose I chose to go my own way. Thank the Lord, I'm about to assault me. I was a teenager, found me just undone and deep sin and yes. changed the direction of my life altogether. Yes. I appreciate yes. that. I was a willful outcast. Yes. Thank God, he, the blood took care of it all. Praise and God. That amazed me the day that I got saved. The Edward sang the song mm -hmm. entitled The Brush. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, that song arrested my attention. I thought, you mean to tell me that God would not even rub in my face or mention the mess that I had made and, mm -hmm. and uh, thank the Lord I'm glad he forgave me that Praise night full of my sin changed Amen. my direction uh, changed God. my history completely I have no yes. desire to ever go back to those things I love him with all Praise my heart God. I appreciated the Sunday school lesson this morning I'm glad that he's chosen yes. whosoever will yes. if he hadn't yes. I sure wouldn't have been on that list I didn't deserve yeah, any any blessing. I didn't deserve any grace, but I'm glad God loved me when I was unlovable. And because of that, I love him today. Praise I appreciate God. all that he's done for me. Blessings. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Angela, you start again. Well, I just want to give a praise for it because I've been hurt my entire life. And I, I'm afraid that it's going to be the same for the working on every single one of us. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> Amen. All right, every heart clear. We don't want to cut anybody off. We've got time for you to give God praise. Amen. Well, we want to we want to pray together and ask the Lord to meet our needs. You know, we we have circumstances and people that face needs and we want to take them to the Lord. Brother Nix, would you lead us in prayer this morning, if you would, please? We want to, of course, remember the youth convention and all of our group that's there. Our bus went, and it was, I think it had one empty seat, 
and several other families drove independently. So a lot of miles and uh, they will all be heading back tomorrow. And we want to pray God will keep his hand on the whole group, 55 of plus people that are in Pennsylvania. The services today, let's pray that God would give our young people uh, the will to make decisions that are right and good and wholesome. God has used youth convention over several years for our young people. So let's remember our kids and all the kids there and all of them as they travel home. We want to continue to remember some others that have special needs today. Uh, Brother and Sister Witt have had a, a difficult time this week and God has helped and I'm so grateful they're here this morning. But uh, we want to continue to remember them. Sister Witt's been in the hospital and I'm so glad she's home and so glad things are improving. So let's continue to remember them. Joyce Cooper continues to need our prayer and uh, Joyce has had some severe pain this week with what she thinks is sciatica, I think is, is kind of the diagnosis. So we want to remember Joyce and continue to remember Sister Albertson. Uh, we want to remember Shamira Winkler. Shamira is in the hospital and has been a very, very sick little girl this week. And uh, she's got quite a road ahead of her, it sounds like. She, they, they gave Shamira a, a shot uh, that was supposed to be a shot that would last her for four months and something happened that caused her to re react to that and uh, she became very stiff and unable to eat unable to swallow very very serious so she is in the hospital this morning and sister Winkler, of course is taking care of her we want to remember Shamira especially as we pray this morning and uh, then uh, Jim Sederna has made me aware of of a court case that is taking place and as my and my understanding of it there's a group of six people who were part of a a uh, peaceful very peaceful uh, effort at an abortion clinic several months ago and uh, i'm sure that you're aware that the political leaders today have tried to make laws federal laws that make it extremely difficult and target people who are peacefully expressing themselves around abortion clinics. And these people are, there are six of them, is that right, Jim? That have been on trial this past week and the jury has been dismissed for the weekend and will take up deliberations tomorrow. And I think it would be very, very appropriate that we would pray that God would have mercy and bind the forces of evil and Satan in this circumstance. So let's pray for these six people that are facing this trauma today. Any other special requests you would like to mention as we pray together this morning? Reese. Yes, continue to remember Reese. So glad to have the entire Litchfield family with us, with us including Reese. Reese, we're glad to have you today. Let's continue to remember Reese. Yes, Linda. Keep remembering Daniel Sher. Yes, thank you. Daniel Sher continues to need our prayers and uh, has made some improvements, but has also had some severe pain this past week. And uh, so let's remember Daniel, especially as we pray this morning. Yes, Angela. My mother is having a procedure tomorrow. He is, has stage four renal failure. And he is in the next step of training and gets up taken care of. He's going to have to call dialysis. There's a lot of things that I could do. I really want to explore the brain, see what they can do with us. She really needs prayer. All right. Let's remember Angela's mother as we pray. I thought I saw another hand. But yes, Dan. Pray for you. Wife of one of my workmen, she got the uh, Shamar's <coughs> shot. The old man had a shot for the COVID vaccine uh, and it poisoned her body. And she's under just really difficult circumstances. She's been in and out of the healthcare worker and they forced her to take this thing. And, she's, and it's been two years and she's still, she's not better. Let's remember what, this. What a rock. Yes, yes. Let's remember this lady, her <coughs> wife of a worker. All right. Let's remember this as we pray this morning. Maybe you have an unspoken burden just by upraised hand, needs that we carry to the Lord. He knows every single burden. Let's stand together. Let's go with confidence and faith. Well, the next will lead us, but let's lead. Let's join him and pray together as he leads us this morning. Father, we thank you for this.
Our Father, we're so thankful yes. to be in the yes. house of the yes. Lord this morning. Oh, Lord. We thank Lord. you for your presence. Yes. We adore yes. your presence. Yes. We Lord. thank you for your word. Yes. We appreciate the grace of God. We're thankful for the blood of Jesus that was yes. shed on Calvary. Yes. We're thankful oh, for every provision oh, God. of grace. Yes. Blessed yes. be the name of the Lord. Today. You're worthy oh, of praise. You're worthy of honor. And Praise blessing the this morning. Lord, Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Amen. We pray that you'll look oh, down God. upon we this congregation to this today. morning. To you today. <clears throat> Minister to our hearts, we Amen. pray. Bless in every part of this service. Father, we're so thankful that we're lifting our voice to a God that not only hears but is able to answer. We're glad for prayers answered in the past, and yes. we're glad yes. for a hope, yes. Uh, yes. amen, yes. a present hope in Praise God's Lord. intervention Praise today Lord. for those we love, amen. those that we're concerned Lord. about, we're thankful, uh, Father, that you know yes. and you understand yes. the burdens oh, we God. carry. We trust you today. Lord, we pray for the, group, the youth group that will be returning Lord. from Pennsylvania. Yes. We yes. ask, Lord, that you'll oh, give them God. traveling yes. mercies. And not only them, but each oh, uh, each group that will oh, be God. returning oh, to their uh, their local churches yes. and oh, areas. Lord, we pray that you'll help yes. give them a good day today, yes. a good closing out of that Amen. convention. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for what oh, you're God. doing. Oh, God. Amen. We pray that God uh, will just have his way throughout the day. Uh, amen. Yes. Work yes. in the lives yes. of young people. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh, Father, yes. we think of all yes. of the requests that oh, I mentioned this oh, morning. Lord, we're we're not, I'm not familiar with all of them, but oh, we're glad that you oh, heard yes. every yes. name, those yes. that have physical oh, needs today, you, those we that are in pain, name. those that we are suffering, those that are facing procedures. Uh, amen. We're, I'm so thankful. Uh, you Father. know every Praise situation. Uh, you know the circumstances, uh, and we're glad oh, you're the great oh, physician, and you're able to help, uh, and we pray you'll answer prayer, uh, amen, for each one, those that have yes. spiritual needs, Father, reach down, oh, and draw their hearts, amen. and help them to sense and to realize that they need a Savior, uh, thank the Lord, we're so thankful for your tender mercies, just have your way today, we think of this uh, of this trial that is going on, uh, these six individuals, Lord, that are, are being tried, you know all about this jury, you know each one involved, we're asking God to intervene, oh God, help us uh, in our land, you know all about this uh, uh, abhorrent uh, uh, abortion that's going on all around us. Uh, Oh, God, we we're pray that somehow uh, uh, you'll help Lord. us as a nation. Have mercy Amen. upon us. Uh, oh, God, oh God, and help those that oh are God. endeavoring to stand for the right. Yes. Yes. Have your way here oh this morning. Yes. The remainder of this service, bless yes. in the preaching of the word, yes. in every activity. Oh, God, we oh need God. your presence. Yes. We're here to receive of the Lord. Amen. 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 We're Amen. hungry people. Thank God we hunger after your presence and we hunger after your word, your truth. Have your way today and we'll praise you for all that you do. For we ask it in Jesus' Amen. precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Nick, for leading us. I want us to get our chorus books before the ushers come. Turn to number 190. Sing my chorus if that's okay. I like to sing this one every once in a while like to put a punctuation mark, an exclamation point after, behind my faith. My faith still works. Let's sing it together. My faith still works.
tithes and offerings, the Lord bless you as you worship in your giving. Brother Caleb, would you pray for the offering? Thank you, Lord, for the Thank you, Lord, for the presence. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be here. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one of us that are here, Lord. That I'm here to worship you, Lord. We ask that you continue to have your way in the service, Lord. We ask that you make it easier for Brother Skepler to preach the message yes. right on the party. Lord, we ask that you make it easier for each and every one of us to respond to the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We ask that you bless this offering, bless the giver, bless those who can give and those who can offer everything you do for us. We carefully give you all the glory and honor. Amen. Amen. change this week. We had been announcing the membership meeting for this Wednesday night. We're moving that to a week from Wednesday. So that'll be on the, the, the 31st. So uh, no, move to the 7th. Is that correct? All right. Move from the 31st to the 7th. So keep that in mind. And uh, we'll plan on that. This Wednesday night, there is the apologetics and appetizers. Wednesday night service will be at the fellowship building. And uh, this is something that Andrew has, has planned for, so let's remember that. And I look forward to that session. It will be a little bit different uh, format, and we'll have some fellowship time, but we also are going to learn. Well, let's just come and find out what he means by apologetics, all right? So uh, maybe giving a reason for your faith or answering questions, that's, that's a good, good thing. So keep that in mind. We're working Byron and Amy extra hard this morning. Uh, I didn't know when we asked them to sing that uh, they would have 24 in Sunday school class. <laughs> so I don't know if their nerves are settled down enough or not, but anyway, God bless them as they minister to us in song. Your kids are a delight, and so 24, that was kind of neat. They, they forget that yeah. Griffin, yeah. you know, we have Griffin. So, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> so that's just fine. We love your kids. He's like having 24 kids.
situations that they've been dealing with and um, it's very true that Jesus is so close and he's going to he, he's walked alongside of us and you know we haven't been through some of the the things that y'all have been through but um, we have seen God's grace in our lives and we have seen how he's walked step by step with us and he cares about the little details I mean this week we were stuck in mud and literally quite stuck in mud and we had somebody show up at the perfect time and to us like you know, we, we had no idea how we were going to end up getting out of that situation, but Jesus sent the right person at that right moment. And his grace is just amazing. I just, I would like for you to sing that second verse with us because it is a testimony of this church. And we have exhausted our finding it so, aren't you? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to read this morning from John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Before we do, let me say this. We're gathered together in the sight of God to join this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence in Cana of Galilee. <laughs> now that I have your attention. <laughs> Those are the co common words that we hear in a Christian wedding. So let's go to John chapter 2 and let's read about the wedding at Cana of Galilee. John chapter 2, let's begin with verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins of peace. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, 
and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when, his, when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus of, in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. This encounter with Jesus involves both a single person but various people, if you notice. It's obviously an encounter here with his mother, Mary. It's an encounter with his disciples. It's an encounter with an unnamed family who were at the height of their special family celebration. It was an encounter with the governor of the feast. You know, the, the encounters of Jesus raise some difficult questions sometimes. Sometimes questions that we can't unequivocally answer. For example, why did Jesus seem to have to be pressed into this miracle by his mother? Why did Jesus seem to answer his mother rather curtly? Woman, don't you know that my hour has not yet come? Could this be, as we read it, one of those text message answers that are so common in our world today? <laughs> you know, I'm just a little bit concerned that so many of our kids, our young people are learning communication skills via text. <laughs> you say, why does that concern you? Well, text are only words on a page or on a phone without any tone or body language or attitude or tone of voice. And so we're reading words and we're guessing what is meant by those words? <laughs> I have set a standard for my own personal life and ministry that I do not, I do not conduct, conduct controversial issues on text. <laughs> you know why? Because I can say something or the person on the other end of the conversation can say something and I, I, I read the words but that's all I see. I don't hear the tone they're speaking in. I don't see the expression on their face. I don't see the body language that they're giving. So just reading words and guessing is kind of dangerous sometimes. <laughs> I remember when my children began this process of texting, I, uh, I quickly picked up on it. And my oldest boy was having a little text conversation with a young lady. And I said, uh, I, I checked, no, let me, let me back up. It was before text. It was before, it was email. That's right, it was email, but same principle. And uh, so one day I went into email and checked out, and I saw that they had emailed 100 times in a week. <laughs> and I went to him and I said, now, son, this is going to stop. And I began to give him my reasoning for it. And he could not argue with me when, he, when I said, now you're hiding behind a screen and a keyboard and you're willing to say things that you don't have to face with your body language and your tone and your spirit and your... He kind of dropped his head and said, yeah, Dad, you're right. Well... Maybe that's what we do when we read words like this. We don't know what Jesus' tone was. <laughs> Maybe you're saying, well, he called her woman. That's disrespectful. Well, my grandpa always called my grandma a woman. I don't know why. Never did know why, but Dewey would say, woman? <laughs> well, it's one of the questions we can't really answer. 
Why did Jesus turn water into wine? And of course, the question that follows, and I'll say a little more about this in a moment, but was it grape juice or was it further along in the process of fermented grape juice? Really, God doesn't tell us in this passage. We have to look deeper to know the answer to the question, but, and I will say something a little more about that in a moment, but questions. Do you ever have questions? I think, and I, I think I'm going to take just a little liberty right here, and I'm going to take a little detour from my sermon. Is that allowed? It's only 11.15, so I've got plenty of time. Maybe we should talk for just a moment about questions. Every single one of us have questions. Usually, our questions center around one of four things. They center around, why is God like he is? You know, and we question God's management of our life. Or we question, why am I like I am? Or we question, why is she like she is, husbands? <laughs> Or why is, why is he like he is? We question other people. Or we question circumstances. Why are my circumstances playing out like they are? Usually, all four, all the, the final three of that list of four usually go back to God. Why is God managing my life like he is? Why are things playing out like they are? I don't understand it. Sometimes our questions involve our life, what is happening. Sometimes it's questions about scripture. Sometimes we stumble over things and struggle. I frequently see people stumble over questions they can't find the answer to. What does the Bible mean? What am I supposed to do? And sometimes we kind of get in a charging God frame of mind. Why doesn't God give us better answers, clearer answers? Why doesn't he just tell us? Why is it so hard? <laughs> so I want to give you, and this is really not part of my message. This is, this is a, a side journey. But I want to give you 12 principles to guide you through questions. I think this is very, very important. They're not principles to help you find answers, but they're principles to help you hold steady when you can't find answers. Questions about scripture, about life, about circumstances, about other people, about God. Number one. Just because I don't have an answer to my question doesn't mean there isn't an answer. <laughs> I, dare not, I dare not pontificate on all of these 12 or I'm in trouble. Number two, there is almost always more than one answer to the question. Now, I'm not saying there's more than one right answer. But you can find more than one answer to most questions. Remember that. <laughs> Number three, God doesn't owe us an answer to our questions. If we get in the I'm going to make God tell me frame of mind, God usually pushes the pause button and just lets us stew in our own juice for a while. Yes. <laughs> Number four, sometimes God doesn't want us to know the answer. And I have to remember, he is God. Yes. I am not. Number five, sometimes he wants to know if we will trust him without an answer and accept it. I'll never forget years ago, years ago, I was struggling with a decision that involved my family, wanting direction from the Lord, and I was, I was really struggling. I, I couldn't seem to get clear and and I remember in that struggle, kind of getting in that demanding of God frame of mind. And, I, and as I was in that frame of mind, it seemed like I heard the voice of God speak to me and say, I know the answer. <laughs> well, that encouraged me. I said, well, good. 
And my frame of mind was, so I'm listening. But God quickly followed it with, but I'm not going to tell you. I know the answer, but I'm not going to tell you. Now, are you going to trust me without knowing? <laughs> Maybe that's one of the reasons why I love the course. My faith still holds. <laughs> Number six, sometimes the devil plants questions in our mind to try to sidetrack us from what God is trying to do in our life. If he can get us fixated on our questions, it's amazing what we will miss. Number seven, sometimes God wants to show us our heart through our desire for an answer. Because sometimes our questions, or at least our insistence on answers, are a subtle form of rebellion. Sometimes we don't have an answer because we've already passed up the answer God has already given us. Number eight, sometimes he simply chooses not to tell us because he knows we wouldn't understand. We've got to remember his ways are higher than our ways. Sometimes he just can't explain it to us. Number nine, sometimes he wants, us, wants to know if, if we want to know enough to dig for the answer. Many times our search for an answer is God's invitation to come close. I preached recently on the whisper of God. You have to lean in to his whisper. <laughs> He's not going to shout you down. Sometimes we have to dig for the If he made every answer easy, we would become spiritually lazy. Number 10. Sometimes God wants to see where we're going to go to look for our answer. You can tell a lot about a person's heart condition by looking where they seek answers. Looking at where they seek answers. Sometimes he really wants to know if we really want an answer or if we're just looking for somebody to agree with us. <laughs> Number 11. Don't worry about it if you don't find the answer. Sometimes you live long enough to realize you didn't need an answer anyway. Right. Number 12, true answers, accurate answers to our questions are only grown in the soil of total surrender. If you're looking for answers to serious, life-touching, eternity-touching questions without a sanctified heart, you're likely to be led astray at some point by selfish desires. Well, <clears throat> that's the side journey. Let's see if we can get back. I may take another side journey or two before this sermon's over. God wants us to serve him because we love him, not because he gives us answers. <laughs> and by the way, Many times, all we need to do is act on what we already know and let what we don't know take care of itself. What we know usually keeps us pretty occupied when we think about it. Just keep doing what you know, and a lot of things will clarify. Well, let's get back to the encounter, back to this message. There are questions here, some of which could sidetrack us from what God wants to tell us. Let's look at the lessons of the account encounter. The setting here is a wedding. I read the account of Johnny Carson years and years ago. He was interviewing an 18-year-old boy on The Tonight Show. <clears throat> he asked the little boy, the little boy had rescued two of his friends from a coal mine outside of his hometown in West Virginia, and Johnny Carson had the boy on to talk to him a little while about that, and it became apparent to him that the little, the, the little boy was a Christian. And so Johnny Carson asked him if he attended Sunday school, and he said he did. And Johnny Carson said, what did you learn in Sunday school? What are you learning? What did you learn last week? 
Well, the little boy said, well, last week our lesson was on Jesus went to a wedding and turned the water into wine. And, of course, the audience just hooted laughing. And Johnny Carson was trying to keep his composure, and he said, and so what did you learn about that story? The little boy squirmed in his seat just a little bit. He, he obviously hadn't thought. This little boy was eight years old, remember. He squirmed in his seat a little bit and then his face lit up and he said, well, I learned that if you're going to have a wedding, make sure you invite Jesus. <laughs> Not a bad conclusion, is it? <laughs> you know, our culture has done much to destroy the beauty and sacredness of marriage and weddings, hasn't it? To many, it's not really a sacred occasion at all. Maybe it's so commonplace because sometimes it's the third, fourth, or fifth wedding, and sometimes the marriage proposition has been ignored altogether. Maybe we need to be reminded that God has a lot to say about weddings, marriage. Marriage is God's idea. He started by making the first man a help meet. Wedding vows are sacred before God. We live in a society that just decides what marriage is going to mean to them, if anything. If they want it to be temporary, they make it temporary. If they, they want it to be between the same, same sexes, then it's none of yours or God's business. But to God, to enter into marriage is to enter into a sacred, lifelong commitment between one man and one woman. You know, it's, it's a little nerve-wracking to me that it seems to me the next crisis on the horizon is polygamy. And you're seeing more and more talk about that. But friends, marriage is between one man and one woman for life. God clearly said, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Friends, to change our view on marriage or divorce or remarriage because society has changed their view doesn't change God's view at all. And sometimes we get in the mode of just kind of following a little bit behind the world, you know, though. But friend, let me ask you, where's the world headed? It's not headed in God's direction. It's headed away from God. And sometimes we just move along with the world. And as they move and become more and more far farther from God, we just move with them and say, well, I'm still not where the world is. Friends, that's not the way to measure yourself. You must go back and measure yourself by God's view. Well, in Jewish culture, weddings were special. Jesus was a guest at a wedding in a town called Cana. The, the Jews attached great importance to high moments in life. They loved grand ceremonies and grand occasions. Friends and family would come from miles, the poor relatives and the rich relatives and the eccentric aunts and the strange uncles and the rowdy nieces and nephews. They all came to the wedding celebration. And for, to the Jew in those days, the wedding celebration was not just a brief ceremony. It was an experience that it was entered into by the entire community. It was a community feast. The typical wedding feast could last up to seven days. The t uh, uh, that sounds strange to modern way of thinking, but the ceremony would begin on a Tuesday night at midnight, and after the wedding ceremony, the father and the bride would take a trip to every house where every family in the community would offer them congratulations. The new, newly married couple would hold, hold open house for a week. It was a community experience. Weddings were times of joy and celebration. So at this wedding, this celebration, maybe our first lesson is Jesus came. <laughs> Jesus came. Jesus was at the wedding. We don't know why he was invited. We only know he was there. 
It's like the little boy said, maybe, maybe if you're going to have a, a wedding, it's a good idea to invite Jesus. But I think it means something more. Jesus came to this very ordinary life celebration with ordinary people. Now I want you to get this. The setting here is an obscure village we likely would have never heard of if it hadn't have been that Jesus was at this wedding. As far as I know, we know nothing about any other weddings in that time period. I mean, not specifically. So here's a wedding. Who's the bride? She's nameless. Who's the bridegroom? We don't know his name. They were likely peasants, poor kids from families with no place on the social order or the social register. They were not important people, but to them this was a very important occasion. This typical wedding of a Jewish couple. I want to tell you, Jesus was there, and that's typical of his, of his entire ministry. Jesus wasn't interested in just certain kind of folks. He was just interested in folks. He wasn't trying to achieve a certain social standing. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor, friendly or hostile, socially prominent or an outcast. Never once do you see Jesus paying special attention to someone because of their wealth or achievement or intellectual gifts or social position. That ought to tell us something, shouldn't it? You look at a list. I made a short list. You look at a list of people that Jesus ministered to. Think about it. A widow from name. A nameless lady with an issue of blood. Ten lepers who were outcasts from society, from everybody. A demon-possessed maniac that was living in the graveyard. A thief hanging on the cross beside him. A hated tax collector. A man who laid beside the pool crippled for 38 years. A demon-possessed epileptic, uh, epileptic boy. An unnamed couple at a wedding in Cana. <laughs> it's not exactly your, for, your Fortune 500 list, is it? <laughs> I would think it ought to tell us something. We look at someone who is really important and we can't imagine them being personally interested in us. Isn't it true? You think about it for just a moment. Imagine the President of the United States. Imagine that that president would show any interest in us unless it was a staged photo op for some reason. What could my president possibly care about my life on Rogers Lane in Burlington, Kentucky? <laughs> There's no way he would sit at my table. He would never sit in my recliner. L let me at least clean house first, you know. He would never accept an invitation to my family wedding. He would never weep at my family funeral. I'm just way too common, way too vanilla. I don't have enough to offer. That's the way our world works, isn't it? Why, if I even approached... If our president, and I'm not, I'm not taking swipes at the present president, I'm just saying as an office, if my president were to come to Cincinnati, let's say, I doubt we could get him to Burlington, but let's say he came to Cincinnati, and I approached the president to just say hello, <laughs> why they would grab me and whisk me out of there so fast it would make my head swim. You just don't do that to important people. I think one of the lessons from the wed wedding of Cana is that Jesus really does get involved in the lives of common, ordinary people. Now, I know that's not the way we, 
we usually think Jesus is. You know, if Jesus was coming to our wedding, we would think, oh, let me clean everything real good. No spots on the windows, you know. No kids' handprints on the door. <laughs> we would think we needed to put on the dog just a little bit at least. You know, my best suit of clothes. We humans tend to put emphasis in all the wrong places and on all the wrong things. I read about one lady that went to the, went to the store dressed real sloppy one day. and The next week she decided to try something else. She dressed up in spiffy clothes and went to the same store. She said it was remarkable how differently I was treated. I read a true story about a lady just in the last few days. I mentioned this to my wife. I can't remember the lady's name, but she, she was the widow of a very, very wealthy, multi-billionaire sort of people. And she went to a Rolls Royce dealership. I didn't even know they had those things, let alone been to one, you know. But she went to a Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce dealership and she was dressed like she would go to Walmart. You know, they said that's just the way she always was. And the salesman tried to ignore her. I'm sure they were looking out of the corner of her eye, their eye wondering what she was here for. Until finally she flagged one of the salesmen and said, I'd like this one right here if you don't mind. <laughs> All of a sudden, she had their full attention. <laughs> and she bought it. That's usually the way we handle things, but not Jesus. He came to touch the lives of ordinary people. To enter the daily life. He wept at their funerals, rejoiced with, at their weddings. He, he wanted to be a central part of their families, their activities, their celebrations, their crisis. He wanted to be part of the most important choices they made. He was perfectly at home at a wedding feast. Jesus was not a severe, austere, killjoy. Does that surprise you? <laughs> I, I kind of getting the feeling that some of you still aren't believing me. <laughs> He's interested in ordinary people and ordinary joys and sorrows. So what's the application to us? Simply this, today Jesus wants to enter your life. <laughs> he does. You don't have to be a special somebody in this world. You don't have to be the right people or know the right people for Jesus to want to enter your life. He'll weep at your funerals and rejoice at your weddings. He wants to sit at your table and participate in your idle talk. To be a central part of your family. He wants to be a part of your marriage. He wants to be a part of your raising children. He wants to be a part of your career. He wants to be there for family discussions. He wants to walk the floor with you when you're walking the floor with a sick child. He wants to go to the doctor's office with you when you get your news. He wants to be there when you're helping a teenager climb Fool's Hill. He wants to be a central part of your family's decisions and activities and celebrations and crises. He wants to be a part of your most important choices. He'll be perfectly at home where you live. He's not a severe, austere killjoy. He's interested in ordinary people. I don't know what that does for you, but that encourages me. Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. Lesson number two. Jesus came, lesson number one. Lesson number two, Jesus came to transform. 
It's interesting, this is Jesus' first miracle, verse 11 tells us. There are several things about this miracle that we know. It was his first miracle. The word miracle is sometimes translated sign, Matthew 24, 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Same word. So it appears Jesus is giving us a sign to show us something about himself. It shows his glory, verse 11 tells us. His disciples believed after seeing this sign, verse 11. It was designed to help us believe. <laughs> this story unfolds, a need arises, a crisis develops. We don't know what was going on at this wedding and this family. We, we don't know if this was poor planning. We don't know if this was lack of money. We don't know if there were just more people showed up than they thought were going to come. We only know that there was not enough wine to go around. Now, I, I can hardly preach on this without tackling that word wine. Is that appropriate? <laughs> Wine. <laughs> what about it? Somebody asks, is, is that, was that real wine? Was it grape juice or fermented wine? Now, I have right now, I just saw it yesterday, I have some grape juice in my refrigerator. And if I poured it into a crystal goblet of some kind, you might conclude it was wine. It's Welsh's grape juice, just so you know. Strong's Concordance says that the word here means wine literally or figuratively. But it does raise some questions we need to dwell on just a moment. You know, social drinking. I, uh, I made a prediction several months ago. I don't know if my wife will remember this. I remember it well. We were talking about the movement of the church world. And I said, you know, very quickly social drinking is going to become accepted in the church world. I was right. I was right. There are a lot of holiness people that are getting off track at this crossroads. Now, when I say at this crossroads, I'm not just speaking of the wine or social drinking crossroads, though there are holiness denominations that are former holiness denominations that are, have begun to accept social drinking. That's really sad to me. But, but what I'm interested in is, is this little crossroads of if the Bible doesn't specifically forbid it, I can do it. Has anybody else seen that little crossroads come up? Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about this, so it can't be wrong. Whatever it is. And, and sometimes... People are hiding behind a living biblically curtain with that little approach that, well, if the Bible doesn't say anything, I just want to be biblical, you know. And people are using that argument to okay a lot of things that are proving very, very harmful to God's people yes. and God's church. I can name you people who used to be holiness people who are living by that philosophy. The Bible doesn't specifically forbid it so I can do it. Who, to, who would tell you today that social drinking is okay. It's not wrong. Now, let me, let me just give you, and I don't have time to get completely sidetracked here, but let me just give you a couple of bullet points of why I don't believe that. Number one, if you're going to talk about being biblical on any given subject, you're going to have to take everything the Bible says about that subject and related subjects. Just remember that, okay? And when I read the Bible, I read things like, be sober. <laughs> he 
you say, preacher, is that verse in Peter telling us to not drink? Well, the word means to keep the proper use of your mind. What is the first thing that the partaking of alcohol does? It goes to the mind, to the brain. It begins to fog. It begins to affect. Now, if you, I, I, I wished I had Googled this. I, I started to do it on the platform, and I was afraid you'd wonder what I was doing talking to my phone. But Google the percentage of crimes that involve alcohol. The percentage of sexual abuse and immorality that, inf uh, that involves alcohol. Friends, that's got to be part of our answer to this question. It's got to be. Then you read where God says, be sober. Be not drunk with wine. And then you read that God says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. <laughs> and then you read, be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. Yes, sir. And you begin to develop a scriptural picture that says... You should only allow your mind to be controlled by the mind of Christ. You need a transformed mind. And to think that I would accept a position that would allow drinking of alcohol that deadens my mind and clouds my mind and turns my mind over to somebody besides me and the work of the Spirit in my life is anathema to the Spirit of Christ and Christian living. So, don't talk to me about drinking being okay even socially. You're not going to convince me. <laughs> Okay, well, that was another side line. Yes. But it is important, isn't it? Yes, sir. It is important. Yes, sir. When you're going to decide an answer on any given question, don't be like Captain N Nelson, who con contemplated the Danish fleet in the Battle of Copenhagen. And he put the telescope to his blind eye and said, I see no ships. <laughs> if we're not careful, we'll hold the telescope to a spiritually blind eye and say, I see no harm. I see no danger. How do you decide? How do you decide questions that are not specifically spelled out in the scripture? Well, let me give you... Sideline number three. Let me give you two things. Number one, the answer is not to look around and see what the world is doing. The answer is you must find the specific commands and statements of Scripture, and then you must find the principles of Scripture. Did you know that God frequently gives us principles to guide our life that are not specific? Yes, sir. That are meaningless until we apply them? Right. Let me give you some examples. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, how in the world am I supposed to know what keeping the Sabbath day holy is? I'll tell you how. Let the Spirit of God control your mind. And when he does, he will guide you and you will know what the application of that principle is in your life. There are many, many, many commands that are principles, principles 
that we must apply. Honor your father and mother. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything until you apply it. You must take the specific commands of Scripture and you must take the principles of Scripture. And when you do, then you must ask yourself this. Am I, am I living with a margin of safety or am I seeing how close I can get to the fire without getting burned? I don't know about you, but if I'm driving the dangerous mountain road, I don't see how close I can get to that edge over there. That's right. yes, sir. I remember driving across the state of Colorado a few years ago. I saw, the, I saw the beautiful scenery of that state, beautiful state, all the way across the center of the state of Colorado. I think my wife only saw 25% of that beauty. Because that road we were traveling had a whole lot of places where if you went off, you were in trouble. You were down a ravine somewhere a long ways. And she would say what my grandchildren say. She says, Daryl, 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 Daryl. <laughs> she wanted me to stay as far away as I could get from that precipice. And friends, that's the way sincere Christians live. Yes. That's the way they live. Amen. I must ask myself, am I living close to the line? I must ask myself what the wisdom of the church and godly leaders have said. And I must ask myself the broader picture. What is the broader picture? If I interpret the principles of God's word like this, what door is it opening that things may come through that opening that I did not plan on? Well, I've got, to, I've got to quit. My time's almost gone. I want to get to this. He came, and he came to transform. He was giving us a little taste of what his ministry would be like and what he was like. He came to transform the situation. He transformed the water. He transformed the hopelessness. He brought joy to the situation. What is the key? The key is found in the verse that says, whatsoever he does, he says to you, do it. <laughs> he came to build our faith by transforming. He came to make the useless useful by transforming. He came to make the worthless valuable by transformation. He came to bring hope to hopelessness by transforming circumstances. His transformation. I want to tell you, he wants to enter your life, and I'm going to close. He wants to enter your life, and he wants to transform your life in the circumstances. He steps into the shortage with his resource. <laughs> I confess to you that there have been many times in 40, soon to be 48 years of ministry when I have become very depleted. There have been many times in 40 plus years of parenting that I became very depleted. There have been many times when the pressures of life caused my cup to come up empty. But there's never been a time when I cried out to him. <laughs> and I turned to him. There's never been a time that he didn't come. Amen. To miraculously transform. Oh, he didn't always transform my circumstances. What he usually did was transform me. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Wonderfully fill mm -hmm. what was empty. Mm -hmm. Well, what are your plans? Will you continue to embarrass yourself by your own emptiness? 
Or we'll just cry out to Jesus and say, Jesus, <laughs> I'm struggling with my emptiness. Can you feel me? He will. He will. He will. He is in the transforming business. I want us to stand together and, and I, I want us to bow our heads for just a moment. The closing moments of this message. And I kind of felt like the way I was to close this service was to give opportunity for people to kneel at this altar and front benches. Maybe someone needs to invite him to your wedding. And I'm not talking about literally a wedding. Maybe somebody needs to invite him to what's going on in your life. And you would say, Lord, it's pretty empty where I'm living right now. But I know you want to come. And I want you to know I want you to come. Amen. And maybe you'd like to just slip out and kneel at this altar. I don't think we'll have a general prayer time. I think just for closing prayer time. Anybody like that? I'd like to... I'd like to kneel here to talk to the Lord during this closing prayer time. <laughs> Anybody else? I don't want to live on empty. The crisis of my life is real. I want to invite him to come, transform. Maybe I'm talking to someone this morning that's battled with these questions I talked about. And the devil's kind of hounded you, taunted you. I want to tell you, friends, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is always the answer. Amen. Anyone else? Just slip out and kneel here for our closing prayer time. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this snowy Sunday morning where we've come here, we've come, and we've carried our whole life with us as we've come to this service. And sometimes our whole life is pretty traumatic and chaotic. And sometimes there's a deep emptiness we come to you today we thank you for the example that you want to come to ordinary people that's who we are this morning we're not we're not on some social register some fortune 500 list we're just common ordinary everyday men and women and young people and married people and single people and older people and younger people we come we ask you to step into our lives today, and into our crisis, into our moment. And we ask you to transform that moment by your yes. presence. Yes. Oh God, we live in a world that depletes us. We live in a world that empties us. We live in a world that challenges us. Oh God, would you fill us freshly yes. with new wine, so to speak with freshness from heaven. We're trusting you to do it. Walk with us. Go with us. Talk to us. Deal with us. Anyway, Lord, we pledge that whatever you say to us, we'll do it. We want your will to unfold in each of our lives. We pray that that would be the case. Bless Evan here as he prays. and Others maybe that didn't come to the altar but are praying there at their seat to, to say, Lord, I just need you today. I, I just need your filling. I just need your renewing. I just need your miracle. Oh God, I trust you to help us all. And for all that you accomplish and all that you do for us, we'll give you praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. You're dismissed.